Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Dirk Niebel is a German politician. From 2005 until 2009, he was Secretary General of the FDP, Free Democratic Party. From 2009 until 2013, he served as Federal Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development. From 2000 until 2010, uh, Niebel served as Vice President of the Deutsche Israelische Gesellschaft, the German-Israeli Society. His commitments for the cooperation is clear. In January 2011, Niebel met with Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister Danny Alion and signed a joint declaration of intents aimed to increase bilateral cooperation in an effort to assist developing nations, agreeing to work towards the rehabilitation of contamination, contaminated Lake Victoria in Kenya, the main source of water for several states, and one of the sources of the Nile River. In February of the same year, Deputy Foreign Minister Danny Alon and Nibo met again to examine aid in the New Republic of South Sudan, just as a few examples of the cooperation which he directly has helped with. Uh, but of course, this goes much further. Uh, and this is actually where my colleagues have stopped the bio, because I think, again, the bio is so rich, uh, there's no chance to do justice to it properly. One important addition I would like to add, we remain sincerely grateful to you, uh, Dirk Nibo, for having helped us and supported the Institute in the recent years. Uh, through your role as an advisory board member, we've had excellent cooperations inside and outside of Europe, uh, the recent uh, project that we also did in uh, Montenegro, I still have fond memories of, so it's really wonderful also personally uh, to have you here today to chair this panel. Allow me to say a few words uh, about uh, the panelists uh, which are going to help us uh, to gain further, further insights uh, on the topic uh, for the discussion. First of all, of course, we have the Honorable Dirk Niebel, former Minister of Economic Development of Germany. In addition, we have Mohammed Akubar uh, al Ghazi. Deputy Chairman of the Mali's Al-Shura Council of Oman, Secretary General Fadi Kalaf, Secretary General of the Arab Federation of Exchanges, the Honorable Rashad Al-Balushi, CEO of the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange, the Honorable Hassan Diab, former Minister of Education of Lebanon, the Honorable Yasser Yakesh, former Foreign Minister of Turkey, Samir Borhum, Chief Editor of the Jordan Times, Dia Al-Asadi, Member of the Parliament of Iraq and Leader of the al uh, al ahar Block, as well as Zuraida Dinti Kamaruddin, Member of the Parliament of Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to all please join me in helping to give a very, very warm welcome to Dirk Niebo and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, only maybe for the introduction. Um, the issue of this panel is the economic cooperation between Germany and the Arab world. Uh, Mark told a lot about the german israeli cooperation, also a trilateral cooperation with some Arab countries. In my time as a fe uh, federal minister for economic cooperation and development, I was in charge for mostly the poorer Arab countries, especially for the Palestinian Authority. And to cooperate as a German federal minister with the Palestinian Authority, you have to cooperate also with the Israeli government to make sure, especially in, in critical issues like water, uh, irrigation, um, and things like this, uh, you have to find a common solution because this issue is so crucial in the area, it's so close together, everything, uh, that you have to cooperate with everybody to have a good result at least. I'm very happy that we are here and can talk about the uh, opportunities of German-Arab economic cooperation because I think that we have common interests and sometimes you also have also common values. Even if in German published and public opinion, uh, not everybody is talking about this. We also think that uh, our economic um, um, strengthening is useful for the uh, behavior of the people for their life. And um, for this, um, I think it's very important to know, even if you have difficult or different political opinions sometimes, um, trade and political exchange belongs together because you stay in contact. And staying in contact is one of the main uh, opportunities we have as former politicians and actual politicians. And I think it would be good to get from each of the panelists a first, hopefully short, statement to the issue of this panel because we are eight panelists um, and uh, we have an uh, auditorium which is also interested to come into contact and discussion with us. And so, please, for the uh, first statement from the panel. As a minister, I was in charge of a large ministry and I saw a lot of cooperation, uh, whether uh, on the economic front or uh, other fronts between Lebanon and uh, Germany. 
the ministry uh, basically uh, involved uh, three major sectors, education. You may be aware there are several German schools in Lebanon, and there are lots of corporations in, in that uh, respect. Uh, also, another sector is higher education. There's also a German, school, a German university in, in Lebanon, Lebanese German University, uh, which is uh, doing very well. And uh, I know there are lots of uh, collaborations and uh, agreements uh, uh, between um, universities in, or higher education institutions. There are 48 of them now in Lebanon and uh, universities in uh, Germany. Um, and more importantly, the VTE sector, which is the vocation and technical education. There are quite a few agreements that I signed myself between German uh, organizations and the Ministry of uh, Education and Higher uh, Education. Um, as Vice President of the American University of Beirut, uh, I'm also in charge of the, I represent the consulting arm of AUB, so again, uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to collaborate with quite a few institutions and NGOs and all sorts of projects, whether related to uh, uh, Syrian uh, refugees or otherwise uh, in Lebanon. Uh, but uh, I have to stress that uh, one of the major ways that Lebanon can benefit from is the VTE sector. Germany is uh, um, extremely advanced in the vocational and technical education uh, uh, sector, and I think uh, this is uh, a sector that needs to uh, grow very quickly in Lebanon and in the region because it will address uh, 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 the market needs uh, for uh, experts in hundreds of specializations in the VTE sector, um, and uh, it will also address uh, uh, a serious issue of unemployment in the youth. Uh, so I would like to see that sector uh, grow in terms of cooperation between uh, uh, Lebanon and, and uh, Germany, whether at the public level or the private sector. Thank you very much. We have a broad um, table with issues where we should discuss about from trade frameworks. Um, is it good if only we from Germany can sell our products to the uh, Arab or Mediterranean countries? Or should we also open up our European markets and how should we define the standards? From um, movements, immigration issues, uh, and I'm quite sure Turkey is a very important transmitter between uh, Occident and Orient, um, especially also because of our um, common immigration um, um, knowledges and it's quite interesting to know maybe also for you that even if the small and medium enterprises are the backbone of the German economy uh, much more self-employed employed are immigrants in Germany uh, the mm -hmm. very small enterprises uh, mostly or not mostly but uh, more than in the German population in the in, in the uh, original German uh, population are self-employed by the immigrants. F family, because family enterprises. Family enterprises and uh, they have more opportunities because it's more difficult to get a job in an enterprise for them because of language issues. And today uh, on the flight from Düsseldorf here to Berlin, I read in a newspaper that Germany in the last year um, invested 60 million euros for learning German language abroad to make sure that young people are able to come to Germany for studying. But two-thirds of the uh, students from abroad are studying in German with an English language. So we pay 60 million euro for learning Germany to study in Germany and they study in English. Uh, this is also interesting, but uh, what Mark didn't uh, say during the introduction and, uh, introduction, and I forget before, after I left German federal government in December 2013, I took a year off, and since 2015, I'm uh, working in a high-tech enterprise in Germany, uh, the Rheinmetall uh, Group. It's a uh, high-technology enterprise with two main pillars, um, mobility and security, automotive and defense. And I'm the head of the international strategy development and for the governmental affairs abroad, not in Germany. And uh, what I learned, and I think this could be the starting point for our discussion, um, is well-skilled labor force. During my time as a federal minister, uh, we had the time of the so-called Arab Spring. And we had a lot of, uh, youth, uh, of young people with formerly high education and no perspective for a job. 
and we had a lot of young people with no formal education and also with no perspective for a job. And I learned in my time as a minister and in my time since I'm in this high-tech uh, enterprise that vocational training is the main issue to participate in society and economy and uh, to uh, have the opportunity for a self-fulfilled uh, life later on. And uh, only for starting the discussion, because we have our um, uh, exporting frameworks, especially in the defense issues uh, from Germany, it's more difficult uh, with the Arab world than it should be sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you have been responsible for education in your country, higher education and vocational training. How did you organize, organize it and uh, what could we as Germany help? I remember as a minister we had the GIZ and had uh, our training courses in several countries of the world. Now in our enterprise we have the Rheinmetall Academy. We sell training on different levels. Uh, what's the best way for the countries uh, on the southern side of the Mediterranean? Well, um well, we had uh, major cooperations with GIZ as well as other organizations, but before I uh, answer that, as I mentioned, uh, vocational uh, sector is uh, a sector that Lebanon and indeed the whole of the Arab region can benefit from uh, Germany because Germany is so advanced in that uh, area. Um, uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that education will provide uh, the most uh, long-term impact uh, on our uh, new generations. Uh, we want students to uh, be empowered to get uh, vocational and technical education, not to find jobs, but to create their own jobs, to create their own companies, mm -hmm. to create their own organizations, uh, whether small or uh, medium enterprises. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, the best possible cooperation that will be long-lasting and that will have an impactful uh, uh, results uh, would be in the area of vocational and uh, technical uh, education. It's a matter of, uh, uh, I mean, the protocols are there in as far as uh, cooperation between uh, the two countries. As far, in answer to your question, as far as when I was in the ministry, uh, in fact, I made major changes in the vocational technical education sector, which, uh, uh, I mean, unfortunately, in Lebanon, as well as in the whole of the Arab region, there's a psychological barrier. People view uh, VTE as the dumpster of education. You fail here, you go to VTE, you fail there, which is completely the opposite in Germany. VTE yep. graduates get the best jobs, the best salaries, the best future. And uh, I was trying uh, to, to instill that change. To some extent, uh, I succeeded because, uh, for example, uh, uh, the postgraduate component of VTE in Lebanon is the TS and the LT, Licence Technique. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that this was uh, a three plus two, five-year program. And uh, for some reason, there were courses being repeated, and I transformed that to two plus one. So now you could finish the LT in three instead of five years, which is equivalent to a bachelor yep. in, in the regular academic Master programs. Journey. And that provided a lot of encouragement for students to go into VTE. I also created 3,500 scholarships. So. Uh, uh, of course, the public sector is free, but scholarships, in the sense, they get salary, monthly salary. It's small, but it's an incentive for uh, students, and that also incentivizes incentivize the students to go into this. Uh, and, uh, of course, I saved a lot of money by centralizing labs. There used to be very expensive labs, duplicate, that were one kilometer apart. Again, for political reasons, I don't want to go into that right now, but... Uh, 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 to a large extent, I managed to unify this and therefore save money. So Lebanon is uh, to some extent prepared and ready to benefit from the already existing VTE infrastructure and the already existing cooperation with Germany. But we need to intensify that in terms of uh, volume, in terms of identifying the uh, high priority market needs in Lebanon. And the same model can be replicated for the rest of the Arab region. And I think this will be a win-win mm -hmm. scenario for uh, all concerned. That's very interesting if I um, um, can capture it. Um, what I learned when I traveled the Arab countries, especially in the time as a minister, I learned that um, most of the young people want to have a formally very high universal, uh, university education. and they don't want to work on the ground. But in Germany, we learned that you can earn much more money sometimes 
uh, with a very good education in VTE, uh, more than uh, with studying politics or things like this. Um, how can you change in Arab countries the public opinion that you have to have a university degree uh, to be happy in your life, but not with a VTE? Thank you very much uh, for this uh, interactive session. And uh, my name is Yara Mwalla, I'm from Syria, and I'm doing my PhD in cultural uh, diplomacy and international relations here at the ICD. Um, I, actually, I had two questions. First was about the inter, uh, economic cooperation and how, why is Germany is really interested in investing in the Arab world, and it takes two to, to make a cooperation. So uh, thanks for asking the question, and I mean, if you can also uh, tell us more about that, it would be very useful. And uh, the second question, and it's a very naive question, I'm um, sorry for asking, because I don't have much of economic background, but um, we learned that economic power is part of the hard power. And it's not part of the soft power that cultural diplomacies are doing. And to give an example, uh, that Germany stopped any uh, economic cooperation with Syria and make the sanctions on them. And due to that, there is a lot of suffering in Syria for this. So how can cultural diplomacy play a role in softening this power, the, the economic cooperation? And how do you see the future of this cooperation with countries uh, under such circumstances like Syria? Thank you. And did you ask me personally or whom in the auditorium? It's your turn. <laughs> it would be nice if you ask our guests. <laughs> okay, I, I, will, I will make it short. Yes, uh, economic uh, power is hard, of, is hard power. And I think the German, I'm not part of the party of the Chancellor. I'm a free Democrat, a liberal. A liberal in, in the United States is a communist, I guess. Um, so in, in Germany, it's a free Democrat. Um, uh, so the middle of the political spectrum. Uh, but I was a minister in her last cabinet. And I think she used economic power um, as a hard power for soft results. Uh, when we opened up one year ago the borders, after the people have been on the highway walking to the German borders, it was right. I'm quite sure it was the right decision. It was the only decision. But this was a soft decision, even if, if it was hard uh, for the internal um, policy market in Germany. Uh, but after that, she used the economic power to get a European decision to secure the European borders. Even if some countries don't think in the same way, um, the so-called Balkan route is closed, and we are discussing with our partners in North Africa about registration camps to make sure in the future that people who have a right for asylum or a reason uh, for being a refugee don't have to uh, jump into small boats anymore, but step in a plane and come to Europe. And we have to create uh, perspectives for the people which don't have the right to call for uh, asylum or be a refugee, uh, to make sure that they can create a small enterprise or whatever in the uh, home region where they are coming from or in the region where the um, registrations camp are. It depends on the decisions of the governments of these countries if they are cooperating. But uh, to come to the point now, which uh, allows for Frontex also to act in not member countries of the European Union, if the country is, uh, agrees, um, this is the result, the result of hard power. So economic power can be both. Uh, it can be humanitarian and it can be really strong. Thank you, all the panelists, for the discussion. I'm sorry that we haven't had enough time for every um, issue of the, the um, discussion uh, we could um, 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 call up. And thank you in the auditorium for listening to us and for the last very brief questions.